Hello, hi, hi everyone. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Peidye from Enterprise Singapore, and today we'll be sharing more on um, SG TradeX, the future of interconnected supply chain. So just a little um, housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the, the presentation, please type them into the question box and we'll bring them up during the presentation. Uh, we also have um, questions at the end. So now, uh, without further ado, uh, we'll turn the time over to um, SG TradeX to share more about uh, the common data infrastructure. Hey, hi, hi, hi everyone. Hey, thank you very much for attending this, uh, this webinar. So what we're gonna do today, so I'm Antoine, I'm the, the CEO of uh, SG TradeX. And uh, with me today, I have uh, Yilin, who is in charge of the market development. I have Prem and So, who is in charge of the product. And, and Brenda is leading the, the use case B uh, that we're going to deep dive uh, into uh, today. All right, so uh, the, the content for today, you know, quick background and overview of uh, SD TradeX. So what, what's the vision, what we are trying to achieve and how we differentiate. Uh, to make that a little bit more real, we will, get, we will then, you know, go through one of the use cases that we are currently uh, piloting and, and bringing to production by uh, Q1 2022. And after, we're going to talk a little bit about the future, uh, including, you know, some of the new use case uh, that we are planning to launch uh, very, very shortly. And finally, you know, a little bit of a Q&A session. All right. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of how this uh, initiative, you know, came together. So it started in April 2020 uh, with the formation of the Emerging Stronger Task Force. And that's uh, you know a public-private partnership you know co-led by uh, Chong Ming, who is the CEO of PSA, and uh, Desmond Lee, you know one of the ministers. And the view was to think through you know how the Singapore economy could bounce back post uh, COVID disruption. And so, as part of this task, uh, this emerging stronger task, together task force, they launched a couple of alliance for action. Okay, so one of the alliance for action was uh, around. Uh, sustainability, you had one around robotic, one also around ed tech. And, and the one we're gonna talk about is around your know, supply chain digitalization. And so we started the journey by uh, bringing together uh, a large number of uh, participants, you know, in a room during the COVID time to sort of map a few end-to-end uh, -end, uh, supply chain. So we did that, you know, first with uh, Trafigura, so Trafigura is a big commodity trader. Trafigura you know, came in, brought also their, their ecosystem. Uh, so looking at you know, uh, the asset operator, the, the agencies, uh, you know, obviously also you know, the financial institution, SMEs, MNCs. We did the same exercise also for ExxonMobil, similar exercise with, uh, with country food. And, uh, and lastly, we looked also a little bit at the, at the retail side of thing with uh, uh, the like of uh, Lazada, Shopee, to really understand, you know, what are the pain points and, and what are the opportunity that we see across the uh, the end-to-end -end supply chain. Sorry, we just have a so small uh, technical issue. Okay, Kanika, can you go to the next page, please? All right, all right, okay. And, and the view at the end of this exercise was to say, okay, you know, understand really the supply chain, the end-to-end -end supply chain, understand where are the pain point, where are the opportunity, when we look at the physical flow, and when we look at the financial and the information flow. And based on that, can you can next slide? Uh, based on that, you know, the view was to say that hey, we see a lot of friction in the supply chain. However, if we were to, you know, better share data between the various participants, we would alleviate a lot of those pain points, all right? Therefore, the view and vision around a common data infrastructure. And, and that's what we are, you know, currently building. So, you know, really our vision, can can next slide? Uh, our vision is, you know, to integrate, you know, disparate data silo in one supply chain common data infrastructure. So we've seen, you know, a lot of initiatives uh, that, right, that are trying you know, to digitalize but the digitalization happen in silo and therefore you create new data island. Here we really want to connect you know, the local and the global supply chain ecosystem. And what we are building is this data sharing infrastructure. So think about it as a, 
as a pipe, as a digital utility, as a, as a digital highway, where the data will flow between participants. It needs to be, you know, trusted and secure. So those are table stake, but also, you know, easy to use. Easy to use because, you know, regardless of the maturity of the player, they should be able to plug and play. All right. So if I'm an MNC, I should be able to in integrate maybe via API. If I'm an SME, I should have also a mean to access and to consume and to uh, contribute data uh, to this infrastructure. The view is that, you know, we're going to improve doing so, you know, improve the productivity of the various stakeholder group. All right. And when we think about the stakeholder group, we think about the shipper, importer, exporter, we think about the, the asset operator, so the carrier, the port, terminal operator, haulier, etc. We think about the service provider, so the freight forwarder and the financial institution, as well as the government agency. All right. So we are looking at this entire ecosystem. The view also is that by sharing information between the participants, and when I say sharing information, you know, let's be clear, you know, we are still, you know, uh, uh, really safeguarding the, the commercial sensitivity of the various participants, okay? So it's consent-based. But by sharing, creating this transparency, we're going to improve the resilience of the supply chain, all right? So the resiliency and the trust in, a, in the supply chain is also a key element of what we are trying to achieve. Now, you know, we are standing up, so, so we are institutionalizing this, uh, this initiative currently, and so two entities are being, uh, uh, are being stood up, you know, so you have a market development entity, it's a public-private uh, JV that's in charge of, you know, business development and adoption, in charge of the product, in charge of the legal and the data governance aspect of the initiative, and then we will have the infrastructure on the right-hand side, the infra is publicly owned, and uh, so, you know, the government and the, the like the IMDA is going to be in charge of, you know, operating and maintaining this infrastructure that bring, you know, a sense of security and sort of the seal also of, uh, of neutrality from the, from the Singapore government on this initiative. Um, the brand itself, so as EduTradex, you know, was launched on the, on the 13th of July, so a little bit earlier. And what you see on the slide is, so, you know, some of the key stakeholders and, and participants in the initiative. Uh, so the, some of the founding members are, you know, PSA, Trafigura, ExxonMobil is what we call a Queen B on our use case B. Uh, we have also a couple of the bank, and we are working closely with a number of, uh, you know, government agency, including obviously, you know, Enterprise Singapore, IMDA, uh, MPA, the Maritime Port Authority, and, and MAS on the on the financial uh, uh, side. So if you think about, you know, what we what we've seen in the market, so we've seen a you know, similar type of initiative, correct? So data sharing initiative. We think that we position ourselves, you know, slightly differently, and therefore we're going to be able to drive adoption and again, you know, build trust. So building trust is is very important as well as encouraging innovation. So I spoke already about the governance structure, correct? We are industry led and, and government supported, so it's a public private partnership. Uh, we are also use case led, all right? So we are not data hungry. We are you know, really, really specific and focused on the problem statement that we want to solve. And then based on the problem statement, we bring you know, a number of participants together to think through what's the minimal data element they need to exchange to solve the problem. So that's the current approach. Ease of integration through you know, the technology architecture that, that we're gonna uh, uh, provide you with a quick overview. Overall, this initiative is non-profit non motivated. So we are not trying to extract value from the ecosystem, okay? And we are trying to create value for the ecosystem. I spoke already about neutrality and the neutrality because the core infrastructure is owned by the, by the public sector. Openness, we are not trying to create a, a new club, all right? So any organization, regardless of the size that has sort of a, a verifiable role in the supply chain ecosystem should be able to join. And one of the key design decisions that we made is the fact that we do not store data, all right? And that's very different from what, what we've seen in the, in the market. So on the highway, the data is fully encrypted and SG Tradex does not see or does not have access to the data. Therefore, we are not aggregating data and we are not monetizing data. Obviously, the exchange is also, you know, consent-based. So as a participant, 
you are in control, in complete control of your, of your data, and you decide you know, whom, which data you're gonna share with whom. We are positioned at the infrastructure level layer. So we are not positioned at the application layer. And therefore, you know, we need to work with third party platform and participant on this infrastructure to support them in building you know, application to extract the value from the new data that's being, uh, being exchanged. Okay, so the partnership play is very important for us and we position ourselves as you know, augmenting rather than replacing existing uh, system in the, in, in the ecosystem, All right? So that gives you a little bit of an overview of uh, what we do. If you go to the next page, uh, Kanika. So here we're gonna give you, and, and Prem is gonna walk us through that, you know, a quick overview of the, the tech architecture and, and the three components that compose this tech architecture, you know, the highway, the pit stop. We are quite uh, uh, proud of this, uh, this name, pit stop, and, and, the, and the admin portal. All right, Prem to you. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, okay, so quickly to understand the technology design behind HG3X, try to keep it as business as possible and neutral technology jargons. So, so to begin with, we are on a blockchain-based system, right? So we are, a, we are a very scalable cloud native design. So why did we arrive at this design, right? So fundamentally, we have a clear understanding of what the industry wants, and we also understand what the what are the different systems that has been that were that were conceived and launched and couldn't really capture the market or couldn't really drive critical mass in the past. We studied systems in Singapore and studied systems outside Singapore. And we want to really come and build a technology architecture or a system that can drive trust and transparency. So to design for trust, it's a different thinking that we have to adopt. And that is why we came up with this architecture of uh, pit stop highway and the uh, consent matrix admin portal. Right. So net net, we are trying to replicate how the internet works. Okay, if you want to understand this, very simple, right? When you get an internet connection at home, you get this modem from Singtel, right? And then Singtel or anybody for so this get a modem and then you connect your laptop or mobile phone to the modem and then you start to exchange data. Moment the modem is set up, the Singtel or the engineer comes in and then say, hey, I, I'm buying this internet connection for Prem. Moment they put my username password in the in the modem, the modem understands what is my data limit, what is my, uh, what's my data limit, what is my uh, total download, my phone connection, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, similarly, it also happens in a way that it also happens in a way um, the pit stop also works in the same, same fashion, right? Uh, that is a modem equivalent in HG Tradex. Sorry for that. We have to just switch the camera, sorry for that. Okay, so there is a modem equivalent in HG Tradex that's pit stop. Okay, so fundamentally, when we configure pit stop or company A, let's say Traffic Graph or ExxonMobil, for instance, moment. The traffic graph pit stop understands who is the user. Let's say traffic graph pit stop understands what are the data traffic graph can receive and send from that point onwards. And pit stop remains as a modem for traffic graph to connect with another participant who also has a pit stop in the network. So anybody who joins has to have a pit stop, right? And moment the pit stop is set up, pit stop can enable connectivity. And pit stop supports two different modes of uh, access. Number one, it can support API based access. So API as a technology is booming in, this, in, in the supply chain world, and it's one of the most prominent technology by 2025. And uh, it's going to be the prominent technology by 2025. And as part of API interface, we are following open API specification, meaning it is open, standard-based, globally accepted. And participants can integrate their systems via Pitstop's APIs. And Pitstop also supports a web portal, a web interface, where a non-corporate or a SME, for example, a small medium sized company who doesn't have an enterprise system to integrate via API, they can use a simplified web portal to log in and share data. Now, when the pit stop gets this data, it does a lot of things, right? It supports data formatting, data quality, data standardization, data, it applies data governance policies on the data that goes in and out of pit stop. And whenever I send data to my pit stop, all these checks are made. And then we make sure that there's less gar garbage in, garbage out situation. And Pit stop also does something very important. When data leaves the pit stop, it is end to end encrypted. And the encryptions are standardized. I mean, as per MAS or ABS standards, financial grade encryption. So nobody can literally see or look into the data. So data moves from pit stop A to pit stop B via the highway. So highway is formally connectivity. 
that enables data transactions in Bitstock. Now we have what we have understood is Bitstock Highway and the, the web portal and the APIs available in Bitstock. But before the data actually is shared, there is an admin management portal that every participant, okay, the one that is in the bottom, gets access to. So as part of this admin management portal, the participant chat figure or Exxon Mobil can choose what data they would like to share. So why is it more important? Because we are trying to reflect the business relation, physical world or real world business relationship or contractual relationship in SGTRX. So as a traffic where I come into SGTRX admin portal and I say, I want to consume this data from ExxonMobil because I have a physical real world relationship. ExxonMobil gets a notification to say, hey, traffic where this is a company and their company is verified. Would you like to give information for traffic where ExxonMobil says yes. A digital handshake is established and then the data can flow between these switch stops. And this is very important in our design because we want to control privacy. We have to give privacy back. And these are some of the elements, the pit stop, the admin portal, the end-to-end -end encrypted highway builds trust in the system. And we, you, we, are, we, are, we are very sure that participants are going to ask the pit stop can see the data. Hey, what if the pit stop looks into the data, right? I understand the data leaves pit stop is encrypted, but what if you having the pit stop can look into the data? So that's why we have an option for participant to host their own pit stop in their own data center or cloud in, in infrastructure. So they can take the pit stop, post in their own environment. So they are rest assured that any data that leaves the pit stop or within the pit stop is fully secure and confidential and thus putting privacy first. Right. So this is the overall architecture. I'll take a pause here and see if there are any questions or we can also do later. We'll do later. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. We are moving the computer around. Um, all right, so uh, just, just to make this uh, initiative a bit more real, you know, so we're, we're going to talk also about the, the use case that we are piloting on the infrastructure and that we are bringing to production, you know, by uh, Q1 2022. So currently we have three use cases, all right? So the first one, uh, it's called, uh, you know, trade finance and, and converting efficiency. And what we are trying to do here is to digitalize the relationship between you know, the, the oil storage operator, the financial institution, and, and the trader. And by digitalizing this uh, relationship, obviously, you know, bringing operational efficiency, but also, you know, bringing trust in the ecosystem and enabling the bank to, you know, finance more trader, especially more SME trader. So really, you know, reducing the gap in financing that we see currently. All right, so that use case, uh, use case A. Uh, the use case C is actually you know, very similar to, to use case A, but looking at the bunkering sector, you know that you know, Singapore is the world's uh, you know, top bunkering port, we want to remain its competitive advantage, and therefore, again, you know, bunkering, uh, sorry, digitalizing you know, the operation, the bunkering operation between the various participants. Currently, you know, a very fragmented ecosystem, um, lots of you know really paper based, and we believe also that we can bring back trust in the ecosystem. So we see you know financial institutions who have been you know pulling away from this sector because of lack of transparency and the fear of you know double financing you know some of the uh, uh, some of the instruments there. So by again you know sharing data, connecting you know, the player, we think that. Uh, we're going to make the supply chain in this sector much more uh, reliable. All right. Uh, we are working you know, very, very closely on this use case with, uh, with MPA and their uh, initiative also on digitization. The third use case, and Brenna is going to work us through the use case uh, a little bit later. So it's on the logistic uh, sector and, and trying to understand you know, how to improve uh, the operational efficiency of some of the key players, the haulier, the depot. Uh, the shipper consignee and the carrier, you know, by sharing some of the key operational data while obviously, you know, preserving the commercial sensitivity. All right, so those are the three use cases that we are currently uh, uh, bringing. Uh, can if you go to the next, uh, the next page? What you see here, it gives you a sense of, sort of, you know, how we are working. So, you know, for each of the use cases, you have a public and private lead. So again, you know, this element of public-private uh, uh, governance that we are following throughout the initiative. So the public lead, you know, on the on the use case here are ESG and Exxon Mobile. The public was sorry, ESG, the private is Exxon Mobile. And then you see a number of persona that we define on the use case. And for each of those persona, 
uh, we have you know a couple of organizations that come together, you know, like-minded organizations that come together to sort of co-create the use case. And at the heart of the use case, what you see on the next page is really you know, the data element and the data field that we exchange between the participant to solve the problem statement. All right. So currently, the view that we've taken with this platform, and you see that you know on, on, on this case A, you have both you know, data element and, and document uh, uh, data. Okay, so we have the both the, but the way we are looking at document, we are dematerializing the document. And we are just looking at a couple of fields. What are the key fields that needs to be exchanged so that we solve the, the problem uh, statement in the use case? So you see, just with the three use cases, you know, a significant number of, of data elements that are being exchanged, and that sort of creates value for the ecosystem. All right. Um, what's important also at the use case level is that you know we, we did sort of conducted you know sort of a paper exercise to say okay, there is value in doing that, right? So what you see here is that you know there's significant value that can be unlocked for the ecosystem if we are going to scale up this initiative across the three states. What you see also is that the value you know doesn't equally is not equally distributed between the various participants. All right, but the view is that as we build more use cases, everyone is going to see value on the platform, and therefore you know, the incentive to join obviously is uh, is reinforced. And the last point I want to make on the next slide is the fact that, again, oh, sorry, no, so, so I'm going to make it on the previous one, is the, the fact that we, we are playing at the infrastructure layer. Okay, so we are working, you know, closely with participants, with third-party uh, uh, platform, and so to build the application layer, so that you know we can extract the value and distribute the value to the participants based on the data that's being exchanged. Okay. So that's the last uh, side of the section. And now, you know, Brenda is going to walk us through a uh, use case B. All right. Uh, hi. OK, so thanks, everyone. Um, I actually, I guess to start us off, I wanted to take you guys through a diagram that we made. Um, and this diagram was based on, you know, many workshops that we've done with, you know, different players across the continent logistics. So we spoke to various depots, we spoke to various hauliers, carriers, shippers, and um, really tried to kind of put together um, this image here that captures what are the different pain points that we see across the physical flows of the container, right? So what you see, if I look at the arrows to begin with, um, you know, empty containers being collected from the depot, brought to the shipper consigning warehouse for um, stuffing and then maybe brought to the port um, to be loaded onto the vessel and uh, for export, for example. And along the way, it could be staged on the way. Um, it could be staged at various yards. So, I mean, I'm probably just going to go through, you know, some of the pain points and like try to illustrate them a bit more. So if I go on to the maybe right, uh, rightmost side, for example, frequent changes in vessel schedule. I think uh, hopefully this is something that may resonate with some of the guys on this call, especially in this, um, you know, COVID um, kind of time. We do see that berthing schedule has been changing quite frequently and more and more people have been expressing the need for real-time updates. They want to know when this ETA changes and it's not sustainable to keep changing because of how frequently um, um, this, uh, this schedule has been um, uh, evolving and being updated over time. And this vessel schedule changes is something that affects almost all of the upstream players in terms of hauliers needing to replan the trips, warehousing need, needing to rethink their uh, stuffing schedule, for example, and general coordination. Then if I kind of go to the top section, right, if I look at, for example, what's happening in the staging yard, this is one of the pain points which um, the shippers have expressed is that today, especially for those that have very large container volumes, they actually might need to deal with a higher degree of staging because of all of that uncertainty as to when the kind of the next node, when the next, um, when the next uh, milestone is ready. So because of that, um, over time, this is incurring additional um, costs um, to stage the container and something which we think, you know, to what extent can we reduce it? I think uh, for certain we can't eliminate staging, but the question is, can we reduce unnecessary staging and as much as possible try to streamline for kind of just-in-time container flows. 
Then I go to the middle section um, from a shipper container perspective, and they've also expressed that uh, today they're working with so many different logistics players. It's not always a very easy task to you know, collect this information across these different players, or these, these different sources. And even if they're able to collect it, um, there are also challenges because maybe there are data quality issues um, or the data is not coming in a standard format. So even being able to analyze it also creates, uh, also can be a challenge for whoever's, you know, that control tower trying to get that visibility across the board. And sometimes um, that standard could also be uh, pertaining to, you know, perception of quality, for example. So they've also expressed that operationally on the ground, um, there could be cases where the holiday has brought the empty containers to the warehouse, but um, they'd be like, hey, what's this? I know the quality is not good, please go return it. And again, these kind of um, um, disputes happen and it's adding um, more inefficiency into the, um, the, the container flows across the board. Then on the left-hand side, um, quite a few pain points there, right? So for example, when we look at the hauliers, um, I think hauliers we've heard really bear the brunt when there's a container shortage problem. So, um, I mean, um, typically that would culminate in a wasted trip for the haulier. So they've spent the time going to the depot by realizing that, hey, actually, you know, I need to uh, be redirected to another depot. And sometimes it also could be due to the, um, an information miscommunication that they're actually not receiving ahead of time that, oh, actually there was a reassigned depot. So really there's quite a few pain points, right? And the haulier doesn't necessarily have the right information and um, these wasted trips could occur. We also have, um, you know, issues with long waiting time. In a good scenario, maybe 20, 25 minutes, I could be in and out with a collected um, container. But in some cases, actually the time queuing outside of the depot can take almost hours, two to three hours. And generally, um, that's not something that is very ideal, obviously, for the holiday who wants to optimize and uh, maximize the number of trips that they can make per day. Then time slot management is also an issue that uh, we've realized, you know, could be a hygiene factor uh, that we, uh, we need to look into. There's some people who make a booking, then don't show up, or they show up a bit earlier, they show up a bit later, or they no show. So, you know, um, the issue is if we're not um, giving information on exactly, you know, when are we going uh, to be there to collect and return the container, that makes it difficult for other parties as well to plan based on this information. So um, if, you scroll, if you go a bit down, we heard from the carriers that today, sometimes it can be a bit difficult to forecast and plan the empty replenishment because they don't know exactly when within this window of time the holders are actually expecting to return and collect the container mm -hmm. and that adds to the um, the difficulty and adds to the, the, the occurrence of container shortages at times then in general if i kind of take a step back we, we also know that you know supply chain we're still quite manual communication based we're still a lot of email whatsapp calling um and generally for um, you know, in logistics, there's, there's always so many data points and things are ever changing, right? But for us to get, get this information, um, it can be time consuming to have to look at so many different websites, so many different platforms to get the information that you need to plan effectively. And uh, again, data accuracy, data timeliness are issues that we face. So, I mean, I, I've gone a bit, um, I've been a bit long winded, but essentially these are kind of the pain points that we've heard when, to uh, when talking to the content container logistics players. Then if I move on to the next slide, we've kind of, we say, okay, you know, understanding all of these pain points, really, what are the opportunities that we see? How could SGTRX address these through better data sharing? So, I mean, uh, let's go through the value drivers. Um, so, which are the columns one by one, right? So, um, we spoke to the holders and they say, hey, you know, actually, I would like different, all of these different uh, sets of information from multiple sources. Uh, if this can be something that I ingest directly into my TMS, I could actually plan my jobs better. That's what they said. So we say, okay, you know, what information do you need? Um, it might help with reducing manual effort. It helps with reducing uh, wasted trips. And across the board, there might be less exception handling. Then if I look at the second uh, column, we spoke to shippers consignees and they said, you know, actually, I would really love to get more data uh, to understand the inland container movements. When did the container leave the depot? When did it reach the warehouse? When did it reach the port? When was it loaded onto the vessel? And by doing so, uh, shippers and consignees can better get uh, visibility of the end-to-end -end supply chain. They can analyze better and see if there's opportunities to streamline the order to vessel time. And in doing so, analyze, you know, if there's opportunities for cost reduction and in and as well, there could be indirect benefits for the carriers if they're able to shorten that container turnaround time. Then in the third uh, kind of value driver, we spoke about 
if you know there's better data sharing on the prime mover location if i can get better visibility of you know within that depot drill fence actually how congested how many prime movers are there right now in real time um i think uh, and based on initial feedback i think a lot of people said that such a heat map would actually be very beneficial from the carer's perspective it might assist with certain real-time decision making um to redirect uh, hollis to another depot from a holiday perspective, obviously, that's better trip planning. If I say that, you know, actually, this isn't a very urgent job. Uh, I, I see right now, if I go, it'll be super long time. I will go and stay during a non-peak hour. That's, that's real-time um, inputs for them to better plan their, their trips. And obviously, from the depot perspective, if they're able to gain visibility of the arriving trucks, um, they could be improving their um, asset utilization. And then for the fourth value driver, we also realized that carers can get uh, more, you know, granular information from the depots on specific uh, plan and actual times to return and collect the containers and that could help with the inventory planning so better forecasting reduce buffer stock reduce shortages so i mean we we try to think about different opportunities and how this could be achieved through better data sharing so if you go to the next slide um across these kind of value drivers what we did is we said okay what is the data that we need to enable this to happen. So as a starting point, we started with nine data elements. So some of them are, you know, related to container instructions, um, you know, saying that this is the, um, um, the release order, the storing order, the EDO. Some of them have to do with um, timestamps of, you know, when um, the, the, uh, the holiday enter or exit the port, enter or exit the depot, and some are location-based, you know, following um, the transporter. So you do see different types of data elements, but they are collectively, you know, try to address the value driver. And we've also identified who would be the relevant contributors for these data elements. And, and as we've evolved the use case, we've been, um, you know, trying to add more participants, add more contributors, add more consumers, and get them into the ecosystems to enable data sharing to happen. And really, I mean, um, if you're wondering, you know, this is really just the tip of the iceberg, right? We always see more opportunities for more data elements to be added, more value drivers to be added. But fundamentally, it goes back to the same thing, which is SG TradeX. The goal of SG TradeX is to democratize data sharing. We want people to get access to data that they didn't have before. And for that to happen, you know, it, we need to be very clear about what are the data elements and the details behind it. So for each of the data elements you see here, we define what are the, the data fields. We try to uh, come to a common aligned standard across everyone who is contributing and consuming the data. Therefore, you know, it does not matter if I'm getting it from holiday A or holiday B or holiday C, I'm always gonna get the same set of information and we are agnostic as to which is the, you know, source system or whoever's the provider that you're kind of using. So maybe just to give an example, right? If I say holiday GPS, for example, Today in, um, in the market, there's a few vendors that we have, you know, we have um, CEDA CTR, um, we have um, Holio, we have um, Growth Venture MDT. So it doesn't really matter who are the systems that you're using or who are the holidays engaging today. We're saying that, you know, it does, uh, as long as we're integrated, as long as you're able to give me the required fields in the standard, as long as we're able to speak the same language. SG Trade Act is new trust tool and uh, we're, we're okay to work with any of the providers that are out there in the market today. And the idea of, you know, also democratizing um, data sharing is to give um, the power of innovation back to the consumers. So we, we don't play in the application space. We say, okay, you know, now that you're finally able to get this data, data that you didn't have access to before, we leave it to you how you want to meet the benefits. If you want to get your in-house analytics team to come up with a solution, by all means. If you want to work with a your own trusted, you know, third party vendor to come up with innovative solutions, come up with dashboards, come up with analytics. That's also okay. Um, the idea is really to give the data back to the consumer and let the market innovate. Um, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'm going to kind of move on to the um, next page. And really, I think the idea as we continue to evolve the use case is we try to come up with something for everyone, right? So for the shipper consignee, for example, we recognize that they have certain pain points and therefore there's certain data elements they want to consume. And we think of different ways that they might be able to use uh, and gain benefits from the data. So this is one example. If I go on to the next page, we also see a similar case for the hollers, for example. Um, that whereby we say, okay, you know, as a participant of SG Trade Act, as a, if you're enrolling to use case, could you contribute these data elements? But in turn, you can also consume other data elements, and these are certain benefits that we think you might be able to achieve. 
Likewise, the same thing for the ocean carriers as well. Uh, really, the whole idea is, you know, as much as possible, we want to reciprocate so that you're not just, you know, giving data, you, you also get something in return. And that's something that we've continued to focus on as we grow the use case. And it may not be exactly, you know, equal from the start. Um, there will be people that benefit more than the others, but it is something that we continue to try to innovate and whether it's use case B or other emerging use cases, um, it's something that we continue to try to, to uh, have, a, um, have a situation where everyone collectively as an industry can benefit in some form or another. Okay, I'll move on to um, the next section. Right, okay. Then um, I think in terms of how we would like to work with participants, um, today right now we are continuing to grow each use case, right? When I say grow the use case, I mean, um, you know, we're looking at additional geographies right now, for example. So currently um, the Singapore, uh, the container logistics that we spoke about, we've been focusing on the Singapore players, Singapore depot, Singapore haulier, Singapore port, um, but it is something that, you know, will grow over time. Um, and uh, at the same time, we also want to look at new problem statements, we want to look at new data elements, new personas, new value drivers. That is one aspect of growth. Number two, we're also looking to onboard additional um, participants. And also this is, I guess, uh, really an invitation for any of you who might be interested to learn more about use case B to reach out to us. Uh, um, for us, I think it's quite clear to everyone that really the benefit that we see from SG TradeX depends on the ability for us to hit critical mass. We do need that network effect for us to be able to effectively you know, get the data that we need to do our jobs better. So um, that's definitely one area of growth. And the third one is we continue to try to work with, you know, third parties. You know, we work with potential partners to see how can we make sure that people get the right support they need to actually get the benefits of the data. So while SG TradeX may not be responsible for the application layer, we want to work with um, parties and hopefully, you know, with public um, sectors of um, support as well to make sure that people will be able to have access to these kind of innovations too. Uh, unlock the, the, the value of the data. Then if I move on to the next uh, page, um, you know, as part of increasing the number of participants, um, right now we're actually planning to go live uh, sometime in April 2022. And along the way, we are continuing to welcome more participants to join the SG TradeX. Currently, we're holding a pilot. And maybe just to give a bit of a flavor of what that onboarding process is like, um, you know, uh, it is a lot of discovery sessions, uh, working with your business representatives and your tech representatives to see if you're ready, uh, you know, to integrate with SG TradeX. So after an, an enrollment process, uh, we work with participants to be building and testing APIs to connect their systems with our pit stop. And subsequently, um, we do also um, allow for user acceptance testing. We want to do trials, you know, um, to see how, you, um, how you're going to be exchanging data with your partners and preparing for BAU. And hopefully, uh, once um, we move into stabilization, you're able to exchange live data, you're re able to reap the benefits of um, this improved data sharing. So that's kind of like the timeline that we go through as we work to onboard more and more participants. If I move on to the next page, um, as I mentioned, kind of, you know, what's the kind of a commitment that I can expect working with SG TradeX? Um, typically, um, right now, you know, we are still um, a new um, um, uh, startup, I guess, in a sense. Uh, so right now, it's still a very collaborative relationship where we want to work with your business resources. We want to work with your technology resources and uh, understand your requirements, make sure that we can support um, um, at you as you onboard and, and, and integrate with us. And we do offer different modes of integration. So for some of you who may not be ready for APIs, for example, we do support maybe a web portal based um, kind of uh, way to um, get the data that you need or upload the information that you need. So all of this is something that we can discuss um, as part of the overall onboarding process. Uh, I'll pass on the time to um, Yiling in the next section. I think uh, this slide is really to give you a bit of forward glimpse on SG TradeX plans. So I think Antoine has mentioned a bit on the three use cases that we have, and uh, Brenda has deep dived into use case B on container uh, logistic uh, decongestion. So I think uh, here is just to give you a bit of an idea of SG TradeX roadmap, right? Uh, so we are upscaling capacity to operate 20 use cases in the next couple of years. So we do welcome development partners, you know, to shape the new use cases that we're going to uh, develop. So I think for this, right, I think uh, we have really good traction. We have three uh, use cases that are a bit mature in the discussion. And, uh, you know, we are planning to kick off the use cases uh, by end of this year. 
right? So I think what I want to stress here is as well uh, that, you know, S3 TradeX, we do focus on driving interoperability amongst the various ecosystem partners. So I think as you've seen in the earlier slides, you know, uh, what we mean by ecosystem, right? Really, you know, if you talk about uh, use case B that Brenda has mentioned, it's really your colliers, your depots, your carriers, your uh, operators. So it's really, you know, across that value chain. So we are, you know, agnostic to the various industry verticals because as we build new use cases, it's not, it's not going to just be what we have seen today in terms of uh, trade finance, you know, uh, container, you know, deep congestion or bunkering. But, you know, there are many other areas that we can look at where, you know, we can reduce the friction in the value chain through data sharing. So if I move on to the next slide. So I spent a couple of minutes here, right, to share a bit more on our plans for the new use cases. So I think uh, there, are, there are discussion ongoing with different maturity level, right? And uh, what we want to put a lens on today, you know, out of all these uh, use cases that uh, we are in discussion and we are scoping, I just want to highlight two use cases here on ship supplies and light rate optimization and healthcare and pharma. Because I think uh, these two use cases probably resonates a lot more with the audience here. Right, so the first one is very interesting, ship supplies and light rate optimization, right? Uh, we know that Singapore is a key maritime hub, right? And, you know, ship supplies is one of the many activities that happens, you know, uh, at the port, you know, uh, at the anchorage. So ship supplies and spares currently, right, you know, what's the problem statement here is that, you know, this activity, you know, is currently, you know, procured by the vessels needs at the anchorage or port calls. But you know, this supply activity, the operations, you know, are, are so fragmented and, and you know, perhaps the way that in which this is being handled, right, requires a lot more, you know, data sharing to reduce that friction in the activities. Because a lot of these ship supplies activities are actually happening in conjunction with many other maritime activities like your bunkering operations, your cargo operations. So this silo planning and lack of transparency, right, uh, in this existing ship supplies procurement, right, results in inefficiencies in terms of resource planning and suboptimal asset utilization. So what is it is the pain point that we're trying to solve here, right? How do we reduce this friction, create more transparency? And this is very interesting because we talk about, you know, uh, Singapore being a key maritime hub. So how you improve the efficiency in the upstream in terms of how you procure some of these uh, uh, you know, ship supplies and how it affects the activities at the lighter reach and eventually how it affects the activities downstream to how you optimize and encourage usage. So I think the key stakeholders here is non-exhaustive that you see. You know, we have the suppliers, the shamblers, the truckers, the lighter reach operators, you know, lighter boat operator and vessel owner. So these are, you know, the stakeholders along what we call a value chain. So I move on to the next one on healthcare and pharma. I think this is also a very critical area for Singapore because we talk about healthcare and pharma. You know, this is uh, really one of the key economic pillars of Singapore's uh, with 5% of the GDP contributed by this sector. And I think increasingly so why we need to put a lens on this because, you know, especially in this current COVID-19 pandemic situation, then we realize, you know, uh, a lot of the activities are very reactive, right? So how do we then reduce this friction to enable data sharing to have that end-to-end -end visibility across the healthcare and pharma, you know, personas and landscape to reduce this friction increase optimization, increase utilization, and allow, you know, better movement of cargo flow. So I think, again, the stakeholders here are non-exhaustive, but I thought, you know, it would be good for us just to highlight, you know, how, uh, you know, the manufacturer, the distributor, the logistic partners in this case, and can work together to really, you know, create that, you know, seamless movement of physical and data flow to the healthcare institution and eventually to the end consumer. So I'll just I'll move on to the next slide. So this is just to give you a bit of overview on the new use cases that are being developed. So I think uh, this slide, you know, in summary, what you're trying to say here, you know, if there are pain points, you know, uh, in your current organization, in your daily activities currently, you know, that, you know, that we have mentioned here resonates with you. So I do, you know, uh, ask you to reach out to us to find out more. I think Brenda has shared a bit deep dive into use case B. We are, you know, ready to arrange that one-on-one -on -one session with you to see how SG TradeX can come in 
to reduce low friction. So I think for use case B is very clear, right? The pain points to look out for. You know, you see difficulty reconciliating data on container movement, logistic movement. You know, if you feel that, you know, there's inefficiency in your current supply chain, you know, uh, and you're actually, you know, uh, incurring, uh, incurring costs, for example, like high staging costs and D&D costs, damage and uh, reduction costs, right? So I think these are some of the pain points. If it resonates with you, I think it's good for us to have a chat on use case B, right? And for new use cases, some common pain points that you can look out for, limited end-to-end -end visibility on physical data and even financial flow, right? Supply chain constraints, uh, constraints, if they are now currently managed very reactively, how can you enable data sharing to allow you to have forward planning? So data reconciliation to track your inventory is probably you know, very manual and resource intensive task. How can we you know, uh, also use sg 2 x and work with technology partners to allow you to reduce that friction? So these are some of the common pain points that we hear as we speak, speak to a lot of participants for the various uh, industry verticals. Right? So I think uh, in the next slide, so I'll leave this last slide with you. So, you know, uh, do connect with us, do join us, do spread the word, and we want you to be part of this digitalization journey with us. So our point of contact is here. So if you need to contact us specific for use case B, uh, Brenda is leading the team with Vincent and Junie. And if you would like to talk about developing use, new use cases, you know, and really discuss about some of the pain points that you think SG3DX can help, so do reach out to me. All right, so I think uh, 